Davis from Lithuania. And actually to Estonian and Lithuanian competition uh, authorities. Sarunas Kesarauskas from Lithuania. Oh. And Johan Poldros from Estonia. From... Welcome. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Hello, everyone. We are pleased to have our dear guest from uh, uh, National Competition Authorities. Um, uh, as Kaupo introduced, we um, today we have uh, a representative from Estonia and Lithuania. And uh, uh, first of all, I'd like uh, to give uh, the floor to Johan as he is going to cover some aspects actually um, which relates to vertical agreements and uh, uh, past practice of the competition authority in Estonia and maybe some some additional insights how things uh, is gonna gonna develop. So please the floor is yours. Thank you very much um, and uh, First of all, I, I would like to thank Soranen for organizing this wonderful event. We really value every chance to spread the word of competition, so thank you very much for that. But um, indeed, I, I will uh, give you some insight about uh, Estonian experience in vertical restraints, and uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about the price parity clauses. Um, for some reason, uh, our most most of our activities regarding to vertical restraints have been about the price parity clauses. Uh, uh, there has never been any strategic uh, decision to target that kind of restriction. It is just a matter of chance that that kind of cases have appeared on our table. Um, in particular, we have had um, four different uh, price parity cases um, being uh, proceeded in the past couple of years. Um, um, None of those cases have been formally <clears throat> ended with a, with a decision, but uh, rather the companies have withdrawn all the parity clauses from their contracts during the proceedings. And so far, as to Estonian legal tradition, we have never made a, a formal decision saying that those companies broke the law or not. So I must emphasize that in, in, in none of those cases, you can say that those companies actually did something wrong, but the case was rather settled. Um, all of those cases were concerning online sales. Uh, so indeed, um, I, I, I would say that um, online sales is the, is the area where you can expect to have price parity clauses. And generally, they concerned narrow price parity clauses. As, as Pipe explained, uh, there seems to be a very general consensus among European competition lawyers that uh, wide parity clauses are not OK. But as far as narrow parity clauses uh, go, it is it is something that is still evolving. The, the kind of economic thinking about it has not reached any, any, any kind of final conclusion, whether those are bad things or good things. And I, my personal guess is that this is the way it remains. The, the cases are going to be up to their specific conditions to a very large extent. Uh, for example, uh, probably the best known case in, in Europe is the Booking.com case about price parity clauses. And um, it is a narrow, narrow price parity clause case. And um, there is an ongoing debate, most notably there is an ongoing court procedure in, in Germany regarding whether the narrow price parity clause is okay or not. <clears throat> now, there has been a lot of uh, talk today about the vertical block exemption, and indeed the vertical block exemption, it does give some guidance about the, the parity clauses, but by, by, my personal belief is that uh, it probably is not going to have that much effect on the on the legal uh, handling of those. In particular, it seems that um, only companies with some degree of market power are in position to have the parity clause in the first place, because if you don't have any bargaining power, then it is very difficult to convince your business partners that let's have a parity clause in, in the in the in the contract, it, it seems to be uh, something that uh, mostly is done by by companies that are above 30 percent market threshold, which is a safe harbor according to the to the to the block exemption. Well, of course, booking commerce way over over that. 
And also in our cases, in most cases, you can argue that those companies actually had stronger market presence that, uh, than the, the 30%. Um, and also, as, as I mentioned, um, there is, it is very, very difficult to design a very universal kind of rule how to tackle the narrow, block, narrow, uh, narrow um, price parity clauses because indeed the merits of each individual case are rather different. The pros and cons are, are rather different. So one has to look at the specific case and then the, it is advisable and that kind of case is also to approach the competition authority so that we can we can look into it and give our, give our opinion. Um, now, if you have a company, an uh, online platform that um, that uh, engages into a uh, narrow uh, price parity clause and has some degree of uh, market power, then uh, what we have witnessed or what we have feared is that uh, this might have a, a kind of negative overall impact on, on the prices on the, on the market. Uh, in particular, it means that um, for example, if you think about the Booking.com case, if, if there is a narrow parity clause in the Booking.com contracts and the hotels themselves are not allowed to sell the product cheaper than it is on the Booking.com platform, then one of the outcomes is that there isn't terribly strong uh, competitive pressure on the commissions by the Booking.com. The Booking.com is, is then relatively free to increase the um, um, commissions it has and then the, the hotels cannot uh, respond to it by by increasing the price in the booking com channel, which is which would be a normal thing to do if you have a a, a distributor that charges a lot and the prices in this channel are probably going to be uh, quite high in in, uh, in other circumstances. So um, that that is something that we have heard in Estonian cases. Uh, there has been uh, what has been one uh, one example that has been mentioned. For example, EasyNet is also that we have. Uh, investigated and, and in all those cases we, we have um, seen uh, as, as a negative impact the, the kind of overall effect it might have on the prices of the kind of uh, market. Now as I said each, each case is different and also if you look at the positive effects uh, of the uh, parity clauses then indeed the, the ways they can work the ways the benefits might appear are, are widely different for example uh, world case is, is very uh, very good example here. As as people mentioned, the kind of general run of the mill um, justification uh, for the narrow price parity clause is the so-called free riding argument. I go to the Booking.com, then I find the cheap hotel, but I do not do the reservation on Booking.com, but I rather go to the uh, web page of the hotel where I find the cheaper price and then I, I kind of make use of the investment done by the Booking.com without any any benefit for the Booking.com now. now and that actually has a very strong rationale in it. Uh, now in in case of Walt, we consider that it is very difficult to imagine the free writing uh, appearing in uh, food home delivery. If I found a good restaurant uh, on, on Walt.com case then um, it's, it's very difficult to imagine that I will will go and take the food out of restaurant directly it would be a totally different service then and there probably isn't that kind of competition uh, situation over there then in that case indeed we, we saw that the kind of justification is now much uh, much lower but as I said no formal decision was uh, done in uh, in that in uh, in the end and uh, Walt just withdrew the the uh, potentially harmful provisions from his contracts and um, also for example um, the, the easy easy net case, um, uh, which um, also has its own kind of special peculiarities about the the benefits of the um, uh, price parity clauses. Easy net is a is a company that is uh, selling um, insurance products. I, I believe they are also operating in other Baltic states. Um, and um, uh, one of the benefits of that that kind of platforms is that they are sort of a price comparison tool. I mean, easy net. Definitely, it's not just a price comparison tool. There is a lot more to its service, but that is one of the key elements. And there is this um, widespread opinion in Estonia that uh, it has actually contributed to the price competition between the insurance companies quite a lot. It is a very homogeneous product. Uh, quite many people are just buying price, so to say. 
And uh, in that sense, it has uh, had uh, really positive effects uh, on the competition between the insurance companies. So one doesn't really want to kind of uh, hamper that kind of business model. But on the other hand, of course, the, the question that I asked, but kind of uh, uh, effect would it have on the on the overpriced levels of, of insurance products? That is a the kind of difficult question to answer. But uh, as it um, easy net also withdraw all the all the doubtful uh, provisions from its contracts, and then that's uh, how the we never took a formal opinion. And now, in conclusion, uh, I'm, the very general message I, I'm trying to provide here is that uh, narrow price parity clauses are. Uh, kind of intellectually rather interesting and difficult matter in the competition law. I believe that in many cases they call for individual analysis and um, in case of doubt, the smartest thing is to approach either us or, or, or the law firm, but, but to talk to people who, who really know competition law. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now, um, Sharuna, could you please share your insights? And I know that one of, of the hot topics currently in Lithuania is actually merger control cases, and especially yeah, it, in, in it those... is somewhat different from the main topic of this of this webinar. But um, on the verticals, though, uh, what can I say? Um, we have never distanced ourselves uh, from the from the verticals. Uh, some of the Past cases we had, uh, they concerned uh, vertical restraints, be that uh, uh, G4S and and banks, uh, the big case, uh, 2014, then Maxima Mantinga, again, RPM uh, clauses uh, and distribution of, of, of food. Uh, um, and currently, we also have uh, two ongoing investigations. Uh, I will not change our practice and uh, will not comment on those investigations. Uh, suffice to say, one of them is related to online sales and we suspect a uh, resale price maintenance situation. So th that's, that's on the vertical sales. Uh, to sum up, I would say, They've never been dead. They are alive, uh, and they may be, they will be rejuvenated with uh, increasingly more businesses moving online. Um, we already see that now, and of course, competition authorities uh, everywhere follow the markets, follow the businesses, and uh, uh, if needed, we will investigate. Or we we will use use advocacy measures to help to help businesses to comply uh, with competition requirements uh, in vertical relationships. Uh, but coming back to your question on mergers, uh, you're quite right. Um, this uh, this current year has been pretty uh, generous with uh, with mergers for us, uh, both in terms of. Uh, investigations but also in terms of some interesting uh, some interesting cases so uh, i don't know where to start because uh Davis, you probably know some of them uh, what's what would be most interesting you know uh at least we had one question related to cinema market so yeah. what's going on in cinema market? So I think it would be interesting because it's quite recent case. I don't know if you are in a position to comment on that, but probably you you can. Yeah, I can. And yes, and another thing which I think is rather sensitive. So the right of competition authority to initiate and to ask companies to file actually for merger clearance in those cases when, when it is not um yeah when it is not necessary let's say based on the current regulation or the thresholds are not met and yeah i think um, it is very important also to realize for the businesses what may happen afterwards how to reverse the whole process yeah. after one year when everything is integrated and everything is running as a one unit so what is your approach uh, with that respect? And don't you think that we 
rather would have some different regulation and maybe related not only to the thresholds but maybe to the market shares because sometimes the the the, the consequences could be very 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 uh upsetting probably for the business so just please share your insights what what well, you look, uh, the um, uh, let me start uh, with a second question and we'll okay. move to uh, cinemas uh, later on because i don't know maybe uh, uh, johan will have something to say because uh, i think uh, the cinema mergers was a, a pan baltic issue anyway um you're quite right. Uh, one of the uh, latest news on the on, on the merger front was our authority asking uh, a merger between uh, two online uh, two ticket uh, uh, sellers to be notified to our authority. Um, as you said, that was a situation uh, where the merging parties did not meet the, the mandatory not notification threshold, threshold requirements. But uh, the, in Lithuania, at least, uh, there is a specific rule in the law that allows the competition authority to order a merger to be notified even when that merger is below the notification thresholds, if as a result of the merger, the authority suspects a dominant position could be strengthened or created or, or competition could be significantly, significantly reduced. So um, we have these powers, we have used these powers in the past, and uh, the most recent example is today with the uh, uh, with ticket sales. Uh, it's an interesting point, by the way, on, on the ticket sales. It's not, it's not the first time that we use this power in this market. We did that uh, in 2017. Back then, uh, there was another merger uh, between ticket uh, uh, sellers, and that merger was also below the notification thresholds which back then were even lower. We asked the merger to be notified, the parties did not agree, so we had uh, some, uh, some uh, nice litigation after which the court said, uh, yes, you have to notify. Uh, this decision cannot be appealed. And uh, the parties did notify, we scrutinized the merger and we let that merger go through. Now, uh, four years forward, we have uh, a similar situation again, a merger between two ticket sellers uh, below the thresholds. We order notification. We establish the notification de deadline uh, for the 10th of December. So we'll see what happens. Um, I think this is an important power for the, for the authority to have. Uh, because sometimes uh, competition problems can be created because, of, as a result of mergers, in some smaller niche markets. Um, so this tool allows us to investigate uh, these markets. It, as our history shows, this does not necessarily mean the uh, the inevitable uh, prohibition of a merger. Uh, the merger can still be cleared, but that means that we have some suspicions. Uh, about the effects of that merger. But Trulas, if, if we could uh, actually um, come back to the question, let's say that um, you observe that such a merger has happened nearly a year and a half and the companies have already integrated their activities. What is going to be your role in assuring um, de facto, so to say, the merger? Because uh, I believe that it's it's not so easy and probably there will be some general obligation for the businesses to demerge. But are you going also into the details how this is going to be done in order to have really well, real that, that, that never happened, uh, but I'm not I'm not this is not to say that it will never happen uh, because that is an obvious risk that uh, businesses carry when they merge. Uh, and when the mergers are a below the thresholds for mandatory notifications and b potentially raising some competition concerns, 
Well, here I see a great role, an important role for, for the business advisors and the businesses themselves, of course. They have to assess every merger, the, the potential risks of any merger. And one of the risks includes the risk of, uh, of uh, prohibition from the competition authority. Even in cases in some jurisdictions like Lithuania, where the merger itself is below the notification threshold. So that is something for the businesses to self-assess. And uh, if the businesses decide to go through, well, then they carry this risk of potential demerger. And I agree that it's going to be very difficult if, if that happens, uh, which is why the self-assessment should be very, very serious. Uh, and and pretty honest, I, I can imagine because I've taken part in uh, in, in these uh, in these uh, in these mergers that uh, people are pretty uh, you know enthusiastic about the merger. They wanted to go through, and you know the whole team is uh, working towards the target. Uh, and uh, somewhat, uh, uh, sometimes the the the, the views uh, can be fairly optimistic. But I think the role of the lawyer or any other business advisor and economist uh, should be to cool things down and to say what could be well, the worst case scenario and are we ready for this? Because yes, if a competition authority like us in this uh, in a similar situation prohibits a merger, the first question will be, the first obligation will be demerger. And if you integrate too much, too quickly, that this is going to be difficult. And Sharunas, uh, from general perspective, uh, maybe you see some general trends. I don't know, if you compare like uh, mergers seven, five years ago and mergers, merger notifications which you receive at nowadays. How it differs? Do you see the trend that um, mergers are becoming more and more sophisticated? I mean, I mean more and more concentration actually of the markets in, in, in our small, so to say, market. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I think the best person to answer that question would be not me, but uh, our great team uh, in the merger unit, because they they see and they read uh, the, the merger filings. So one thing to observe uh, very quickly is that the merger notifications tend to, I, I believe from what I know, uh, are becoming longer. Uh, so there are, there's much more information to go through for, for the merger team. Uh, the second thing, and probably more importantly, is uh, that there are there seem to be more mergers raising some competition concerns. And uh, this is not something that is happening only in Lithuania. The, there's probably a global worry about many markets becoming more concentrated. Uh, the worry comes from the consumer organizations, uh, from the politicians, from the competition authorities, academia, and so on and so forth. There is a debate, a great debate, to what extent that is really true, because after all, uh, uh, everything depends on the on the on, on the actual market. But the concern is there, and so competition authorities are responding to that. And I can confirm that we see probably a larger percentage of, of notified mergers that raise competition concerns. They, they do not necessarily end up in prohibition, uh, but uh, there is more work for us to be done. On the lawyer side, I think too, again, uh, I think um, law lawyers, uh, other business advisors play an important role in that, um, in self-assessment and in uh, honest recognition of potential problems, because many problems, I would say, can be solved. Not all, but many can be solved. If they are recognized early enough and if the businesses that merge come 
good idea how to solve the problem. Uh, so in other words, Sharuna's businesses should be prepared first thing for longer processes. And another thing, they they should be very careful with the self-assessment and they should be ready actually to be proactive and not not passive. And here I'd like to, to come back to the initial also uh, question and maybe may ask Johan first before Sharuna is answering because as Sharuna has noted, uh, cinema's market uh, it it related to the to the Baltics actually, and um, I believe that uh, all all uh, competition authorities was dealing with this question. So maybe Johan, are you in a position to comment on that? Can you unmute, please? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Indeed. Um, I believe the cinemas markets has been a hot topic in, in most of the Baltic uh, countries. Um, I, I, I think it is safe to say that it is a peculiar market that has that is quite concentrated right now, but it has never been to my to my knowledge uh, very unconcentrated. It has always been the case that there are a couple of uh, big players in uh, in the Estonian market. And uh, what uh, the competition authority can do and what we have been doing is um, primarily uh, look at it uh, from uh, from the perspective of mergers. Uh, uh, twice in the history, two leading market players have tried to merge in Estonia and uh, twice we have prohibited it or frankly, they have withdrawn the applications uh, knowing that we are going to prohibit so that is that is the main tool that we we have been using but uh, from there on indeed it it is a somewhat worrisome market because um, the concentration is high and um, and there uh, doesn't uh, well seem to be a very easy market entry into it to make it more uh, more competitive but one has to understand here that there is a difference in competition law the the it, it uh, forbids the abuse of dominant position, but it does not uh, forbid uh, the creation of dominant position. Dominant position as such is not illegal. And as far as uh, it has been achieved by organic growth, uh, there is nothing against it. But um, yeah, well, the first thing I think uh, as Estonian competition authority or any competition authority can do here is is uh, is apply a very kind of strict approach in the, in the merger uh, regulation. And Sharunas, what what was happening in Lithuania? Is it is it situation somewhat uh, similar to what Johan explained? I mean, from the market definition perspective, from the market participants perspective, and well, what was the outcome? Uh, as you know, that I was. Uh, we have a long history uh, <laughs> of enforcement action in in, the, in anything related to cinema. It's not only because we like cinema, uh, but we had a prohibited agreement uh, uh, investi uh, cases, and of course we had merger cases. The last one uh, of which uh, was the 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 Pan Baltic merger that would have resulted in. Uh, a merger of uh, Forum Cinemas and Apollo uh, uh, cinema theaters in Lithuania. Uh, you mentioned in your pre in our previous uh, exchange of ideas that uh, sh well, you asked the question: Should businesses be prepared for longer uh, investigations, merger investigations? Not necessarily so. That to a large degree depends on businesses themselves. If the businesses come ready, having done their homework, I don't see a reason why the investigation should necessarily be long. Of course, there is there is one uh, one thing that neither we as competition authority nor, nor the merging parties can control entirely. That's uh, the the market, the other market players, uh, the, the 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 customers or the buyers of the merging parties. Because as part of our analysis, as part of our investigation, we do send questionnaires uh, to the market asking them about the situation there. 
So it is difficult, admittedly, to control the responses from the market. Uh, but, but that is, again, a risk. Um, but in, uh, coming back to cinemas, uh, that merger investigation took a pretty long time. Mostly because uh, when we send uh, a round of questionnaires uh, to the merger merging parties, they were not able to provide the, the necessary answers on time. So the merger had to be suspended, but even that was not enough. Uh, and uh, at the end of the suspension period, the, the parties admitted that, that they, they would not be able uh, uh, well, to provide information and that they lost uh, in a way interest. So uh, all we had to do, we only had one option remaining to terminate the administrative procedure of uh, of merge investigation because we did not have sufficient information to, to assess the merger. So that merger cannot go through in Lithuania. That's the current situation. OK, so no big cinema, no big conglomerate in the Baltics. Uh, no the big conglomerate being. in the Baltics. <laughs> And uh, very briefly, uh, uh, to finish uh, off on, on, uh, on mergers, we have uh, another big saga related to Seagates. Seagates, a provider of internet uh, services, uh, wanted to acquire a company operating in the, re in the northern region of Lithuania. Back in 2019, they, fi they filed the first uh, merger notification. Uh, after our preliminary findings, they decided not to go through with the merger because the findings were negative and uh, well, they decided not to not to challenge them. That merger filing led to us opening an investigation over the uh, suspected submission of incorrect and incomplete information. And we issued an infringement decision this year that relates to, to that investigation that we started back then. And we found that Seagates uh, uh, provided incomplete and incorrect data uh, as part of the merger notification process. So that was the second uh, point. And the third point, the Seagates uh, filed another merger notification uh, at the end of last year, asking for the second time to acquire the same company. Uh, our response was, the same again. Uh, this time the parties waited until our final decision. Um, and, and again, that as things stand now, that uh, that merger cannot go through. But that's uh, an interesting uh, uh, story of, of several episodes involving uh, Seagates. Shogunas, from what I hear, it is uh, probably very obvious that the role of uh, of business, the role of their consultants is really important in those um, in those processes, and the professional advice, of course, may may reduce the risk of such a, such a processes infringement for provision of improper information and and similar things. And here I'm I'm very sorry we are running out of our time. We have two minutes remaining. And um, I'd like to thank you all for participating in, in this event. I know that it's never enough time, actually, uh, to, to touch upon all the um, important, uh, important aspects. Uh, so thank you very much once again. Uh, we hope to see each other um, in the in the in the future, and here I pass the floor again to Kaupo, who is supposed to 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 make a closing remarks or at least one remark. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, also, thank you, uh, thank you, Sarunas, and uh, and thank you, Johan. Uh, thank you for this open open discussion. This is a tr true um, true open administration of 21st century, where authorities actually contribute to the dialogue, and and we we really appreciate that. So, but uh, this is this is now my 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 sad duty to conclude this uh, webinar. Uh, I, I hope you all found this uh, webinar uh, useful. 
uh, we remain open to your feedback to the to the webinar and also proposals for uh, for next uh, next uh, webinars uh, what would be the topics to cover during the next webinars all our presentations this will be published we are happy to help you with specific questions uh, but uh, we're happy to respond to your specific specific questions, but we hope we have clarified many things in the in the questions and answers uh, uh, form as well. So so thank you. Have a nice day. Stay safe. And as the modern times saying goes, stay negative. Have a nice day. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good day. Bye.